How would your favorite UFC fighters be rated if they were to be put in a video game? Well, because EA Sports has the laziest developers and they have the most typical NPC style of fighter ratings, for example, they have Bryce Mitchell with 94% submission offense. Like, with all due respect to Bryce Mitchell, he's a great grappler, absolutely. But he has one submission in the UFC. The guy has like 10 fights. Let's get fucking real for a second. Yan Zhao Nan has been given a 96 submission defense. You would swear she had like some Alexander Volkanovsky, Harry Houdini-esque escape. Like Volk had against Brian Ortega. Volk had three of them. Where the hell is this coming from for Yan Zhao Nan? I mean, goodness gracious. We also have Charles Jordan. Pillow hands Jordan with 93% punching power. Jordan hasn't finished a fly in the UFC. All right? So I'm going to discuss what I would rate these fighters using UFC EA Sports styles of ratings out of 100 for every single statistic. We are going to be creative with some statistics. Maybe I'll even come up with some of my own. So without further ado, let's just get right into this. Let's properly rate these fighters as if we were making the most perfect UFC game ever. But the first guy that we are going to properly rate is Sean O'Malley. For O'Malley, I'm going to have to say that his pipsqueak levels have maybe started to decline a little bit, especially with that dominant win over Cheeto. And becoming the first guy to bruise up and cut and like break bones in this man's face, Cheeto that is, for O'Malley to beat him up that badly, he's looking more dangerous, more intimidating. I, I do think that his pipsqueak levels are declining. I might have to just drop them to about a 94. O'Malley's speed, we're going to have to put that up there at about a 99. Phenomenal speed. His variety on the feet, dude, O'Malley's got so many great attacks. Uh, he can switch stances for variety. I'm going to give him a 99. For personality and his ability to speak and command attention, I'm going to have to say O'Malley is unfortunately at about a 70 right now, or, or maybe I might even have to say a 65, um, just barely passing when it comes to being able to even be noticed at a press conference. He needs to do a better job at that. Uh, O'Malley cannot, for the life of him, command a room. Last but not least, O'Malley's durability. I'm going to add five points to it because unlike the Aljo fight, unlike the first Cheeto fight and the Yan fight, he looked a lot more sturdy, looked a lot more durable. All right, he didn't show up with broken ribs. He didn't have a, a problem with his nerve. So I'm going to have to throw an extra five on that. Mateus Gamrot. Gamrot flukeability level, I'm going to have to put that at about a 99. All right, before I could put it at 100, I need to see him fluke it against a, a top contender in a number one contender's fight, or maybe even a championship bout. But a fluke over Armand Sarikian, losing four rounds and still getting the decision. Then we have the Fazeev moment where Rafael Fazeev throws a kick that he's thrown 10,000 times. And for the first time ever, he severely injures himself while doing it, which is kind of crazy. So for that, that that's got to be mentioned too. And you just got to bring up the fact that his style is just so fluky in and of itself. I mean, look at the way he beat RDA. He almost got finished in the first round. How does he come back to win the second and the third? He simply just smudges RDA into the canvas and into the fence. No damage, no dangerous element at all, just a bunch of smudge. So for his smudge levels, I'm going to have to give Mateus Gamrod a 99 out of 100. He's really good at just smudging people into the canvas and shit. Um, ground and pound, I'm going to say it's about around that Gilbert Burns level at about an 83 or an 82. Submissions, we might have to put that in the 70s with about a 75. His only submission that I can think of is over Jeremy Stevens, who was a on the verge of retirement, washed up featherweight that moved up, that was, you know, fighting in a big size discrepancy matchup. Mateus Gamrot, one of the least dangerous men on the ground, but saving grace, he can take a lot of people down. He has really good takedowns, great chain wrestling, and I might even need to say that's a 96 out of 100. His takedowns are phenomenal. And don't forget about that underrated right hand. Mateus Gamrot has a really sneaky right hand, might need to give that a 92 out of 100. On to the next one, Big Paulo Costa. Paulo Costa, I'm going to need to set the record straight on this guy. Again, I know people think of him as a big, powerful dude, but when you can't KO a chinny Robert Whitaker with a flush spinning wheel kick, we got to really start accepting that Paulo Costa's power is actually abysmal for how big and strong he is. It is crazy. I mean, you look at Paulo Costa, you expect him to be laying people out, but I will give Paulo some credit when it comes to thud. 
which is basically the most amount of power you could possibly have in your hands before you're actually able to KO people. So Paulo Costa has big thudding punches where no one's really getting rocked, no one's really getting buckled, but they are feeling those and they are shelling up and they're thinking, damn, you know, I don't want to just sit here. I, I got to move out the way a little bit. So I do give Paulo Costa at least a 98 level thud. Just not enough power to be able to KO you. So power-wise, I'm going to have to put Paulo Costa in the very early 80s when it comes to power, especially because he's a middleweight. And to be honest, I've seen more knockdowns from Marvin Vittori. Speaking of Marvin Vittori, IQ, fight IQ, I'm going to have to put that at the maybe 72 level for Marvin. Durability, we're going to have to put that at 99 for Vittori. Super durable. Uh, stubbornness. We're going to have to put that at 100. Marvin might be the most stubborn fighter ever. No matter what happens in a fight, he's going to stick to his game plan by any means necessary. Even if that game plan failed, oh, he's going to stick to it. Potential to be a champion if he actually fights the way he needs to fight? 100 out of 100. We all know that Marvin Vittori, if he really changed his style up and went just barge mode, barged for like the local barge, steamboat, and just ran at people nonstop, spamming takedowns, putting his chin on a silver platter, just breaking people with nasty forward pressure instead of worrying about winning the outside foot battle. I feel like Marvin Vittori tries to fight so smart. Listen, winning the outside foot battle, okay, trapping your opponent's hand and parrying it, you're never going to be a champion like that. So potential to become a champ if he actually does what he needs to do, 100 out of 100. Talent? <laughs> Um, well, skill wise, I might not, I might not say it's very high. I think talent Marvin is at like a good 79, but his durability, because it's so high, that's what gets him by Anthony Smith, Anthony Smith on paper might have the most incredible resume you could ever imagine because on paper, he technically beats everyone. But the stat that I really want to get into first is an ability to beat John Jones on paper. And for Anthony Smith, it does seem to check out. It does seem to make sense. So I'm going to have to put that at a 99. Thudding punches for Anthony Smith. Again, he doesn't have a ton of knockouts, but he does have that big thudding power. And you don't want to just sit in front of it. So I do think that Smith has a good level of thud as well. Delusion might need to be in the 99 levels too. It's just hard to get to, you know, and, and but I, and I wasn't I wasn't fast enough to close the distance. I was definitely faster than him. I was definitely faster than him, but I wasn't fast enough to close the gap of, of the range and stuff. But I guess none yeah. of them are like you don't ever like you're confident. And you know, you know what you're capable of, man. Sometimes you zig when you should have zagged and you end up in some shit. You know, it's just man. Sometimes you zig when you should have zagged and you end up in some shit for him to chalk up his losses to Magomed to chalk up his losses to John Jones, especially. And of course, Johnny Walker too. Sometimes you zigged and you should have zagged, which is, <laughs> this is so unbelievably delusional. Tembo Garimbo, Tembo Garimbo, who in my opinion, I think that Tembo Garimbo would at least have to be the highest rated finesser in the entire game. I do give him a 99 out of 100 when it comes to finessing. Again, 100 is like, we're going to need to see Dembo get a main event first, but he's up there and I think he has more than anyone else. And business-wise, I would say Dembo Garimbo's marketing strategy is slowly building and I think right now it's it's in the high 90s. So I'm going to give it a 95 because I know that behind the scenes, he is a cutthroat businessman. So Dembo Garimbo getting a house from The Rock, finessing the UFC, uh, just, I mean, he's, in my opinion, one of the best minds, one of the most humble, kind fighters that there is. Uh, inspiring level, I give Dembo Garimbo a 100 out of 100 in terms of inspiration. And yeah, I, I think that Dembo Garimbo overall might have to be at least a 93 out of 100. Of course, we need to see some more skills from him, but imposing his will, catching people off guard, ambushing people... Dembo Garimbo's ambush levels, because again, he kind of lulls people into thinking, oh, it's little old Dembo, you know, he's got such an inspiring story, such a sweet guy and all that. And they kind of go in there with like a sparring buddy-buddy mentality and Dembo Garimbo fucking catches them off guard and puts them out, like runs across the octagon like a madman. So I'm going to have to give Dembo's ambush abilities <laughs> a 100. <laughs>
A 100 out of 100, dude. Cyril Gaon. Effort? I'm going to have to put that at about a 75. I do believe that Gaon, although he trains, although he goes through the motions, it is just that. Going through the motions instead of going to a grittier gym with great wrestling and people his size, he chooses to train with welterweight grapplers in a nice little gym in Paris. He chills playing FIFA, and when he gets into a grappling situation with John Jones, there's no kicking, there's no yipping, there's no trying to get out. It's just, all right, this is it, this is it, I'm just going to chill. And that's it, he's got too much of that chill mentality, all right? He's he's chilling too much. We need Gon to be a little bit more uncomfortable. Comfort, cozy level, I'm going to have to put that at 95 for Gon, but I would like to see him drop that down to 60 eventually maybe even less gone's just enjoying himself too much and you know gone's not made millions of dollars like mcgregor but he basically acts like he has and that's the thing that's going to hold him back let's get on to another heavyweight that we all like now it's not all negative for gone i mean i actually would rate his athleticism very high i'd put it at about a 97 the dude moves around like a fucking cat with the agility that he has at heavyweight in my opinion, he may be the best technical striker that we've ever seen in the heavyweight division. Another really impressive stat or attribute that Gon has, and now this would be difficult for a video game because it would be up to the person that's playing, but it's shot selection, okay? Gon is not a headhunter. He's not just a guy that goes to the legs and throws a bunch of pitter-pat leg kicks. He has about every single strike that you could think of in his arsenal, and he uses them and mixes them perfectly. The best ability that I've ever seen in the upper weight classes when it comes to throwing a, a mixture of strikes to different targets, whether that's the body, the legs, the head. He has some of the best knees to the body and he's not just using them in the tie clinch. He'll just like dart in with a really solid, perfectly timed knee. And that's what he was doing to destroy Sergei Spivak. And it's especially dangerous that this guy can mix it up so well at heavyweight. Pair that with his athleticism. I mean, he's a fucking nightmare. Right, if you're shelling up to the head, he's going to the body with teeps and knees and big body kicks and spinning back kicks. If you're bringing your hands low, he's going up there with jabs and good right hands and head kicks as well. He'll have phenomenal leg kicks. So I think his shot selection is going to have to be up there at about a 98 or a 97. Let's get on to another heavyweight that we all like, Shamil the Blob Gaziev. For Shamil, I'm going to have to say his gas tank is about a 65 maybe even a 60 out of 100. But you know what? I don't even think it's the gas tank. I think it was the approach. I think that his approach to fighting Jarzino Rosenstrike was really the worst part because to me, it seemed like he was trying to beat Jarzino with a menacing grin. If I were to have a sport based on having a menacing grin, we might have to talk about Shamil the Blob Gaziev being the best that there ever was. But unfortunately, it's MMA and you can't just grin in front of someone and eat a bunch of big meaty jabs from Jarzino Rosenstrike. Blob levels, might have to put that up there at 100, unfortunately. I mean, listen, Shamil embraces it, but I, I might have to put that at 100 as well. Grappling, maybe like a 80 for a heavyweight is pretty solid. And just thud, I'm gonna have to say his thud is up there at 100 out of 100. Let's get on to the next guy, Josh Emmett. You can't just fucking stand at range with big meaty hooks. Big meaty hooks. <laughs> big Emmett's about to throw one. Hooks. I'm throwing big Emmett, meaty hooks loading up for one. Throwing big meaty hooks. Oh! Big meaty hooks. Big oh! Meaty hooks. Jab high, jab low. That overhand right comes. Big meaty hooks. Josh Emmett striking in general. I'm honestly going to have to say it's about an 85. Of course, Josh Emmett probably has like decent striking compared to most featherweights. But when it comes to the rankings, his technique, it's just not all that. Like the guy does the exact same thing every single time. And that's dipping his head and coming over the top with a big gnarly overhand or, you know, going side to side with big meaty hooks. And if this was a big meaty hooks contest, for sure, Josh Emmett would always be the winner, but it just simply isn't. It's a fight and he's not the best fighter, but because he's so powerful and I might have to put that power up there at the 98 level because Josh Emmett for a featherweight has some nasty power. Let's be honest. It's really the big meaty hooks. 
which I might have to put up there at 100 out of 100. Nobody's got a bigger meteor punch than Josh Emmett. I mean, just look at what he did to Bryce Mitchell. But there is still someone that's even more powerful than Josh Emmett, and that is Ilya Teporia. You know, just like Jeremy Stevens said back in the day, Conor McGregor TKOs people. When he hits them, they don't fucking move. Right here, the hardest hitting 145 pound, the real hardest hitting 145 are right here. This guy TKOs people. When I knock people out, they don't fucking move. Like, Who the fuck is that guy? Well, Emmett, we know that he had a nice little KO over Bryce Mitchell, but he was moving. He was twitching. Ilya Teporia folds people, and they don't get up for at least a couple of minutes. They're out cold. Ilya Teporia's hook, in and of itself, that might be the best hook in all of MMA. People talk about Pereira's left hook, which is also excellent. Ilya Teporia's right hook, flush, is probably the nastiest lights out punch in MMA right now. So I'm going to have to put that at 100 out of 100. It's not the meatiest, okay? But it's just really crispy, perfect technique, and that nasty power is on there too. So we're going to need to say that as well. Um, efficiency for Ilya Teporia. He's so efficient with his style, right? Even though Volkanovski is a high output guy that was throwing so much more than him, he had to work so much harder than Ilya just to be out ahead by a couple of strikes. Ilya would throw much less, but everything he throws, he lands. He's kind of like Jan when it comes to being efficient. And of course, it was just a matter of time before he got that nasty knockout. Speaking of Pyotr Jan, I'm going to have to put Jan when it comes to just technique, just pure technique. Jan might be one of the most technical fighters in the game, 99 out of 100. His kicks, body kicks, leg kicks, spinning wheel kicks, his boxing combinations, even his jab in his last fight. Hell, his takedowns, his tie sweeps. Jan has some of the best technique I've ever seen. That's why he's so fun to watch. So I, I do really respect Jan. As a technical maestro, I would rate Jan as maybe a 100 out of 100 technical maestro. If there's anyone that looks like they're out there actually conducting like being a conductor, and we're not talking about Darren Till conducting style where he's waving his arms around, being, being a freaking conductor when he's not actually throwing anything. Jan is a real conductor in the cage. Okay, so 100 out of 100. <laughs> Darren Till. So when it comes to the most one-dimensional, disappointing strikers to ever walk the earth, you might need to put Darren Till out of 100. You might need to give him a solid maxed out score when it comes to that. Potential to be an actual music, musical conductor might need to put him up there at 100 out of 100 too. Now, when it comes to excuses, I might have to say he's up there at about 100 out of 100. Okay, no disrespect, but Darren Till, he, he serves up a mean excuse. Nice, hot and ready. Okay, saying things like no excuses, the better man won in the night. I know the last thing you want to do is come in and make some excuses or anything like that. Was there some issues with your leg? With it? Yeah, uh, you know what? I don't like to sit here a lot. And I'm not that type of guy excuses, but... <laughs> Always the butt with Darren Till, right? Always the butt before he offers the excuse. But, you know, it was, a, it was a real good fight. I feel like I won it. I feel, I feel like we both we both won the fight. I'm not saying I feel like I won it. We, just, we both won. It was a clinically great match. In another world... If Robert Whitaker does not attack Darren Till in that fight, maybe he's able to get through it without an injured knee, all right? If Whitaker doesn't stomp on it and attack Darren Till, maybe Till would have performed a little bit better. Now, here's the thing. Potential for Darren Till is up there. I'm going to have to say it's 95 out of 100. Darren Till has a ton of potential. I just feel like he really squandered it. Now, they called him the left hand for a reason, because that's basically all he threw. He was kind of low output. But when you saw this dude throw leg kicks and you saw him throw elbows and kicks to the body, Darren Till, his technique is perfect. His speed is great. His timing is great. His distance management, phenomenal. Yeah, I mean, look at how he did against Drickus Duplessis. Darren Till did not get touched up on the feet by Drickus Duplessis at all. Distance management, I'm going to have to say it's up there at about a 95, okay? Technique, it's up there, 96. Leg kicks, they're up there. The issue is that he just doesn't throw these other attacks. So omitting opportunities, might need to put that at 100 out of 100, okay? Squandered potential, may need to say that's about a, a 98 for Darren Till. He's still considering making a comeback.
unfortunately, we're going to have to talk about that takedown defense. I'm going to have to sit here and, and be honest about it. Back in the day, people said he had good takedown defense because he was like a strong dude or whatever, but it, he never really proved it. May have to just say a, a 78 for takedown defense and submission defense. Oof, non-existent for Darren Till. Not once have I ever seen him fend off a submission or even try to fight through it. When Brunson took him down, when Drickus Duplass, he took him down. I mean, Darren Till was tapping before they even had the choke. So, yeah. Josh Parisian. Josh Parisian's ability to impose his will in his last fight looked phenomenal against Rebellus to Spain. And so for that, I'm going to have to bump him up at least 15 points for trying. Okay? I would have had him in the NPC levels at heavyweight where those fat heavyweights that should be fighting three weight classes below the heavyweight division, they usually just go around doing a whole bunch of nothing, throwing like five jabs per round, a couple of kicks, maybe a clinch here and there, but they're not actually doing a whole lot to win the fight. It looks like they're literally just automated robots out there just going based on whatever they were programmed to do. But Josh, Josh Parisian, <laughs> I'm going back to Josh Emmett. Josh Parisian's ability to impose his will in that Rebellus to Spain fight, you look at him running it to Spain. I have to give him plus 15 points for imposing his will. Okay, who else do we got to get to? Joe Pfeiffer, saltiness levels for Joe Pfeiffer, they're up there. They are up there right around the Salty Mall Hill level, but just a little bit higher because he's a little more enraged than Salty Mall Hill. So I would give Salty Mall Hill maybe a, a 97 level of salt for Joe Pfeiffer. I might have to consider him at the 100 spot. I don't think it's possible to get saltier than Joe Pfeiffer. There's no forgiveness. There's no bygones be bygones. There's none of that. It's just uh, he's out there against the world and you're going to feel the wrath. Power levels for Joe Pfeiffer, 100 out of 100. He did break Francis Ngannou's punching record. And although he's not been able to show that in his fights whatsoever, we just have to trust that he is the strongest man on the planet. As far as thud goes, might have to be 100 out of 100. It's kind of crazy how Joe Pfeiffer's got like thudding power despite the fact that, you know, he's... I mean, to be honest, is he really flatlining guys like that? He's flatlined a couple cans. It's almost as if he's not the biggest puncher in MMA. But either way, um, has a very basic skill set, like big, powerful blast double leg takedowns. You know, he can smudge you into his submission because he has the size advantage. But when he went up in front of the Joker who we know is just one of the best submission artists in the entire game. And one of the greatest, craftiest fighters, he didn't look like he had a deep skill set. And let's talk about the Joker for a second. Crafty levels might have to put that up there in the 98s, okay? Although his power might have to be there in the 50s, maybe even the 40s. We're going to actually go down to the 40s for Jack Hermanson for his power. It's like, I can't watch you throwing those punches, landing those punches, and feel like I could do an Irish jig in front of them, all right? <laughs> like, you just can't do that. So his power might be at a 47 out of 100, but his crafty levels are up there. That jab, that jab looks so crispy. I might have to put that jab right there at 92. The only thing holding it back is it has no staying on it. But it was kind of bruising up the nose of Joe Pfeiffer. Boxing defense, just instincts and everything. I might need to put that at about a 95. And we know when it comes to the ground and pound, Jack Hermanson's pretty solid. Uh, that is the one place where he's kind of dangerous when he starts throwing strikes. It's on the ground in full mount. Might need to give him a 98. And when it comes, maybe not a 98, maybe like a, a 94. When it comes to snapping twigs and snapping limbs, 100 out of 100. Jack Hermanson submissions are particularly nasty, particularly mean. And for that, like, he might not have the best submissions, but they're particularly mean. He's snapping bones and snapping limbs. He's a nasty one. So you don't want to get caught in one of those. So there's that. CM Punk. We're going to have to talk about CM Punk. A lot of people would consider CM Punk to be just straight 40s across the board. I might even say he's probably got a little bit more pop than Jack Hermanson. He's got that old man strength. I'm going to have to give him that. You don't want to stand in front of him, right? He might be, he might not have the, the heaviest punch. He might not have the best technique, but you're not going to want to stand in front of the guy. Um, craftiness levels, I'll, I'll give this to CM Punk. He is kind of crafty. He might not be the best technically, <laughs> but he's an old crafty grizzled vet. And then uh, I might even have to go as far as to say that old CM Punk, he does have kind of a nice jab. I'll give him that. He, he can stick behind the jab. He can stick behind it. He has a good ability to impose as well. At least he went out there. We're going to have to give CM Punk an A for effort, okay? An A for effort, a participation trophy. 
crafty levels. Let's be honest, at least a 78. He is kind of crafty. <laughs> CM Punk is kind of crafty. So I'm going to give him a nice solid 78 there. The next guy on this list is going to be Schmitty. I'm going to give Schmitty a 98 out of 100 aura. I still have heard rumors that when O'Malley got to the club after defending his belt against Cheeto Vera, people were still mistaking Schmitty as the heavyweight champ and totally forgot that O'Malley was a UFC fighter. And durability wise, I did see this video of Schmitty taking a nasty body shot from Tim Welch. And honestly, Tim Welch is a big dude. People say he's like Canelo. And I bet he has Canelo's power too. You look at this. Look at this. It doesn't even affect him. Look look at imagine if, if Tim Welch ain't hurting this guy. If Tim Welch is not hurting Schmitty, you think O'Malley's hurting? O'Malley was a little pipsqueak power? <laughs> There's no way O'Malley would be able to hurt Schmitty with a real body shot, dude. Gilbert Durinho Burns. Now, Gilbert was actually one of the inspirations for this video to begin with because of how much the fans overrate his offensive grappling. And EA Sports does the same thing. And what I mean is, because of Gilbert Burns' grappling background, his ADCC jiu-jitsu competitive background, people talk about this guy like he is so dangerous on the ground. A lot of people often pick him to win his fights via submission, and it just never fucking happens. And this guy cannot really hurt people on the ground. Even guys that aren't known finishers, like Colby Covington, who's another welterweight grappler, Colby Covington is more offensively impressive than Gilbert Burns in MMA. He has better ground and pound, 100%, compared to Gilbert Burns' little pitter-pats. When it comes to submissions, Colby may not be the better guy, but when Colby takes people down, he drains their gas tank a little bit more, and people just become a totally different fighter, and getting taken down by Colby can really change the course of a fight. And when Gilbert takes people down, well, let's just say they usually live to tell the tale. So let's get into the ranking for Gilbert Burns for this video game, the Lucas Tracy MMA video game. The first stat that we're going to get into is Gilbert Burns' defensive grappling. When I'm saying defensive grappling, we're just talking about is this guy able to keep himself away from harm, out of submissions, out of ground and pound when he's on the mat. I'm going to give Gilbert Burns a 100 out of 100 for defensive grappling because not a single person has ever hurt Gilbert Burns on the ground with ground and pound shots or submitted him in MMA, all right? When Hamza Chemaev, who is one of the most dangerous offensive grapplers in the entire sport, who also is a submission artist, who has a, a big size advantage over Gilbert, when Hamza can't do shit, when he gets the takedown and Gilbert puts him into a bad position and threatens submissions that makes Hamza uncomfortable, when Hamza can't establish control, that's insanely impressive. The same thing can be said about Gilbert's fight with Damian Maya. Damian took his back early on in that fight, and Gilbert Burns, within 15 seconds, just simply got up, which is crazy. I mean, people have survived. Very few of them have survived Damian Maya taking their back, but no one has been able to just get out of that position so quickly. And so for that, you know, people just cannot, for the life of them, get the edge over Gilbert offensively on the ground. And that makes him so fucking good. It's because he can offensively grapple against you and you just can't against him because it's hopeless. It just is. But let's get on to Gilbert's offensive grappling game. The submission offense, his ground and pound. How does it look? Well, I actually think that these video games really overrate him. Okay, I wouldn't be surprised if UFC 5 has similar ratings to this, but UFC 4 has Gilbert Burns in the mid-90s for ground and pound and submission offense. I'm thinking we got to bring that back quite a bit, maybe by 10 points minimum, okay? Gilbert Burns has had so many opportunities at welterweight where he's taken people down. He's had so many opportunities to actually hurt people, to be a dangerous man. And I'm starting to think it's not just that every one of his opponents has the best submission defense ever, okay? I know people praise Jorge Masvidal for his submission defense, Wonderboy Thompson for his submission defense, but maybe it's just that Gilbert Burns doesn't have the best offensive grappling, and maybe it's that Masvidal, Wonderboy, they haven't faced tons of dangerous grapplers. I know Masvidal survived with Damian Maia on his back, but Burns has had a moment where he hurt Woodley and got on top of him and couldn't do anything about it. Jorge Masvidal, he was talking about going into that fight. It was important for him to actually hurt someone on the ground because fans were talking about how he was a little bit of an overrated offensive grappler and he couldn't do anything. 
And then you look at the Jack Della Maddalena fight. Took down Jack Della Maddalena multiple times. Was not able to do anything. I think that Gilbert Burns is ground and pound striking. For the most part, it's just little pitter pat shots, right? It's it's not even like big thudding ground and pound shots. I know he submitted Neil Magny, who is the only guy he submitted at welterweight. I actually think that Neil Magny is a more dangerous grappler offensively than Gilbert Burns. And I know that sounds weird. One guy got submitted by the other. But what I mean is Neil Magny has really solid ground and pound. He's finished guys like Mike Malott. He's finished, what's his name? Uh, Daniel Rodriguez. So when Neil Magny gets on top of dudes, he's actually, pause. He's actually able to like posture up and land really dangerous ground and pound shots. Okay. Whereas Gilbert just can't. Colby Covington, I said, is better ground and pound. Shavkat Rachmanov is a better submission artist. I'd go as far as to say Gilbert Burns is not offensively that great in the rankings for a grappler. I think Bilal Muhammad may actually be more dangerous than him when it comes to at least hurting people with punches on the ground. Gilbert Burns takes people down and they not only live to tell the tale, but they get up to their feet and they honestly feel like they're, it's like they're getting slapped around with little fairy punches. Gilbert Burns is little fairy punches. Okay. <laughs> so listen, man, I respect the Gilbert Burns, but I do have to keep it honest. I'm going to give him a, a hundred out of a hundred submission offense. I'm going to give him a hundred out of a hundred pitter pats on the ground, little pitter pat smudging punches. He's really good at smudging people into the canvas, but I'm going to give him when it comes to control, ability to control guys, I'll give him a good solid 95. Give him a good solid 95. What does that make Jack Della Maddalena, by the way? Um, but either way, I'm going to give him an 80. <laughs> yeah! I could just picture all the jiu-jitsu nerds in the chat. I mean, in the freaking comments. Um, saying things like, what are you saying, man? Gilbert Burns is one of the best submission artists in the game. Your casual mind just can't comprehend it. <laughs> yeah, sure, buddy. Sure. Yeah, my casual mind can't comprehend the fact that he can't get submissions. Um, listen, listen. Listen. We're just getting started, okay? We're getting started. Gilbert Burns, you, you guys get the point. Uh, I, I do think that people kind of depict his style in an inaccurate way. I think his ability to like negate all of offensive grappling coming in his direction is what makes him so good. Combine that with the fact that he's also dangerous on the feet and super powerful. And he can take people down and control them every once in a while too. So let's get on to the next fighter. Let's get on to Benoit St. Denis. This ought to be a good one speed let's discuss the speed of benoit so i would probably give benoit saint denis maybe like a 89 his speed in general is kind of atrocious like he isn't mr speedy gonzalez he's not very fast he's not that quick twitch he's a heavy hitter he's got some thudding punches for power i'll probably give him like a good solid 94 maybe 93 good decent thudding shots for grappling, let's talk about the grappling. Submission offense, Benoit St. Denis. I'm going to have to put him up there at like at least 95. At least 95. He's dangerous. He's a dangerous man. Ground and pound? I'm going to have to say that Benoit St. Denis ground and pound. I'm going to need to put him up there at like 94. Maybe 95. He's got really good ground and pound. Cardio? I'm going to have to go ahead and say 97. <laughs> I honestly think that Benoit St. Denis has some really good cardio. Uh, but he just didn't show up with a good version of it last time. Let's talk about the, the defense, though. I do think that right now Benoit St. Denise's defense on the feet. Grappling-wise, I'm going to give this guy a 97 because he's never been held down, never been controlled on the map. But his striking defense, it's atrocious. I'm probably going to have to say 74 for Benoit St. Denise. Horrible. 